Welcome, everyone. My name is Suzanne Pachetti Johnson. I'm the program manager for Avenues to Wellness, and we are a program of the Frank R. Howard Foundation, and this is our speaker series. I am very proud to introduce our guest speaker today, Diane Smalley. Thank you, Diane. Uh, she is a licensed acupuncturist who's been practicing since 1985, and she's going to be speaking on the very interesting and under valued subject of the lymph system. So thank you so much for being here today. So today we're going to be talking about the lymph system. It's spelled L-Y-M-P-H. And to the extent that the lymph is flowing in the body, that means our immune system is going to be plenty strong. So every part of our life Every part of us has a role in our immune system. I thought we'd start by kind of defining what immune means, what immunity is. And you know how when, you, when it's cold outside, you put on a coat? Well, that's part of the immune system, is responding to the conditions. You, when you leave your home to go somewhere, you lock the door to keep an intruder out. And that quality goes all the way through our skin, through our senses, into the core, and down to the very small level of the cells. One thing that I like to say about natural medicine, which is what I practice, earth medicine you could say, is that we look at the whole body. We don't just look under the microscope to see what's not in the right place. We really look at the whole system. And so that, when we're finished today, we're going to realize that the lymph system is just integrated into our whole body. So our community, the people around us that reflect us and give us feedback and that we interact with, that's part of our immune system. Our instincts, you know, what should we be doing, our, our awareness. And our skin has a lot of immune factors on it. Our nerves, you know, when something's hot, we pull away. That's part of what protects us from being burnt. And our muscles to, to move out of the way. Then going down to the cells, the cell membranes themselves, and then the enzymes in the body, and the blood flow and the lymph flow all pay, play a part in our immune system. The lymphatic system is all about moving the cellular waste from the cells. So on this slide, we've got a picture of the blood flow and the lymph flow. There's actually twice as much lymph and lymph fluid and lymph vessels in the body as there are blood and blood vessels. I think of the lymph system as being the highway of the immune system because all the messages that there's something that needs to be handled in the body, all those messages flow through the lymphatic vessels and lymph system. In fact, just a few years ago, I heard about the uh, discovery of a new organ. And they call it the interstitium. And uh, by the way, I'm going to have all the notes from my talk at the end of the talk so that you can review. And so I'll spell that on the, the notes. And when I was reading about the interstitium, they said, oh, now there's 30 organs. I can't remember how many it was. And I thought, 30? Gosh, that seems like a lot. So I looked it up. And they're calling the skin an organ and many, you know, all the glands and things organs, including the nose and so forth. And so that's why there were so many. But the interstitium, they discovered it by looking through the cells um, with a what's called a live microscope, looking at the living cells. And they saw a lot of things that they didn't see, that you don't see on a cell that's prepared on a slide. And what it is, what the interstitium is, it's this web of a network that goes between all the cells. And when I saw that, I thought, gosh, that's the lymphatic system. Those are the lymph vessels. Because the, just like if you took a jar of marbles and poured water in it, you can get quite a bit of water in there between all those marbles. So if you think of all the cells in the body, the trillions of cells in the body, that they're bathed in fluid. And I like to think of all the fluid that's not in the bloodstream to be the lymph 
the lymph fluid. And so that, it's kind of an old-fashioned way of thinking about it, but that's the fluid that bathes all the cells. And so when, oftentimes we also think of the lymph, when we, when we mention the lymph, we think of the lymph nodes. People will always just, that's the first thing we think of. But the lymph nodes are just filters along the way of the vessels, and we'll come back to the lymph nodes in a minute. So going back to the blood, the blood is made up of basically red and white blood cells and platelets and, and other things that are suspended in a liquid called plasma. And you can see on the slide that the top there's the blood vessel. And it shows some of the different cell types of cells in the, that are flowing in the bloodstream. So we start with the heart. And the blood is lucky. It has a heart to constantly pump the blood through the body. The lymph's a little different. But the, the blood is constantly being flowed because it needs to exchange nutrients and oxygen and so forth with the cells. So after the heart, we have these large vessels that leave the heart, and then they branch off and get smaller and smaller to arteries, and then we get down to very tiny little vessels called capillaries. This slide is really, if we think of it as showing the capillary level, that vessel there, the plasma, the capillaries are kind of leaky, and the plasma flows out of the blood vessel. And it takes with it all the nutrients and oxygen and so forth to go to the cells. And once that plasma has left the capillary, we can think of it as the lymph. So the lymph is the, the flow, the medium through which all the nutrients go to the cells. And now we, ha now we have the cells, and just like we take in food and put out waste, every cell in the body takes in nutrients and puts out waste. So all that cellular waste needs to go somewhere. So that flow from the blood vessel, from the capillary to the cells continues on and kind of picks up in that interstitium and the waste flows into the, the uh, lymph cell. Lymph cells, the lymph vessels is what I mean, the lymph vessels. Lymph vessels are very tiny. They're, the, the walls of the lymph vessel are basically single cells just lined up next to each other. And so it's easier for, there's the space between the lymph vessels can open and close as we move. So now we have the waste picked up in the, in the lymph vessel. Here's the key thing, here's another slide. It shows the, the, the structure of the body. So it, ha it has a person like this. And from, the, from about the waist up on the, so we divide the body in half down to the waist. From the waist up and the, the whole right arm and so forth, you know, the whole right shoulder, the whole right side of the body above the waist, all of those lymph vessels collect and collect to and go into a major lymph vessel over here. The rest of the body, both legs and the whole left side, all collect and go into a vessel on the left side. There's also a flow that goes deep into the belly and that comes out on that left side. So, so you can see already that that puts the lymph system a little bit, gives it a little bit of a challenge to keep flowing when that whole left side, both legs and all that needs to flow. So if we could look at the body, and I have another slide. This is a picture I took from an airplane window because I love looking at those river canyons from the airplane window because that's how, that's how water flows, and it's just exactly the same in the body. It's, and, and you can see from the other side of the slide that there are, there are specific flows that those vessels uh, follow. So I mentioned a minute ago that the heart is the pump of the, of the blood system. Well, the pump for the lymphatic system is every muscle in the body. So every time we move, every time we stretch, every time we stand up and walk around, that's moving the lymph. And it doesn't just pump it straight up the leg, for instance. As we move the body, it, it pumps the lymph to the surface. I call it the flesh layer. It's just under the skin. It's very close to the skin, but just under the skin. So every time we move, the lymph is kind of pumping, pumping the blood just under the skin. And if we could highlight that, it would look just like a river system. Like there's little tiny, springs here and then it's collecting and collecting into 
more of like a little creek, and then it comes into more like a little river, and pretty soon we have a whole river system, and it's called a watershed, in fact. So the arm flow tends to go to the armpit, and the legs flow up the legs and go to the groin, and then the flow from the legs tends to go join that deep belly flow. And then there's a superficial flow on the whole torso. And eventually all of those vessels collect to Humboldt Bay, I like to call it, <laughs> up here. There's two major lymph vessels right under the collarbone. If you can tap this bone at the base of your neck here, this long bone here, that's the collarbone. It's also called the clavicle. And just under that is a major vein the subclavian vein, under the clavicle vein, and all the lymph that's collected and collected and pumped up just under the surface dumps in, joins with that venous blood. So veins are the name that we use for the blood vessels that are returning to the heart. And so that subclavian vein is going right to the heart and it's getting pumped to what we call the organs of elimination. And so the organs of elimination are basically the liver, kidney, and spleen. It's interesting, in Chinese medicine, we think of those three, those three channels flow up the, the inside of the leg. And they are the three, well, the spleen is part of the middle burner, we call it, the middle warmer. But the kidney and liver are considered to be the lower burner. They're, they're organs of elimination. They receive blood from the whole body, and the liver receives blood from the whole digestive tract. The kidney is constantly filtering the blood hundreds of gallons a day. And then the spleen is also a filter. And so the blood is flowing through those filters. The liver does hundreds of different things. It's the most metabolically active part of the body. It's, we call it the, the laboratory of the human body. It does, it does over 500 or 700, I've also read, separate functions. Um, it provides immunity against infection, and this is part of how it does it, by, filter, by taking in that lymph and clearing it. And it also produces most of our proteins, and also produces cholesterol and lecithin. Cholesterol and lecithin are kind of like a uh, yin and yang pair. They balance each other out. Cholesterol is kind of the glue, and lecithin is the anti-glue. <laughs> it's an emulsifier. It keeps the cholesterol in solution. The liver also um, creates many proteins, produces a lot of other proteins, and uh, it clears the body of many things, all the chemicals that we might take in, including drugs and alcohol. And what the liver does is it makes bile. Bile is the outflow from the liver, and the bile is very important for our digestion and um, many, many other things, and including keeping our blood sugar even. The, the liver and the pancreas work together to keep our blood sugar on an even keel. And then the kidney, the kidney is another very important organ, the liver and kidney. Um, and the kidney, it, we can call the kidney more of a true filter. So it's filtering the blood and removing the wastes, and especially nitrogen in the form of urea. It's coming out of the, being taken out by the kidney. So the kidney is very important with keeping the pH balance even. The kidney controls our blood pressure. It also helps to produce red blood cells. It pr helps to produce vitamin D. And um, there's, it produces the hormones that, that do that. And then the third organ of elimination is the spleen. Um, so just to back up the kidney, the liver, I'm sorry, takes up most of this whole right side of the body. It crosses the midline and it's this whole, it's just below the diaphragm. And it takes up a lot of room in the, in the body here. The kidneys are right about here on the back. And then the spleen hangs out under, just under the ribs on the left side. And, um, the way I like to think of the spleen is, aside from being a very important part of the immune system, it makes a lot of uh, immune cells and stores antibodies and things like that. It has these very tortuous little um, blood vessels that are 
kind of like a hairpin, have lots of hairpin turns. And if we think of the blood cells as like a semi-truck, when the semi-truck gets a little old, it has a hard time making it around those hairpin turns. And so the spleen knows, oh, that's an old blood, red blood cell. So we'll, we're going to call that red blood cell out and recycle it. So the spleen has a huge job in clearing the body of older red blood cells. And this comes into play, for instance, like sickle cell, you've heard of that. A sickle cell is a perfectly healthy red blood cell, but it's an unusual shape, so the spleen thinks it's old. And so the spleen takes out those sickle cells too much, and that's, that's where that becomes a problem. But like I said, the sickle cells work just fine. And so these are, those are the three organs of elimination. So that venous blood that where the, the lymph dumped into that venous blood, that venous blood goes right to the liver and spleen and kidney to be cleaned. So that's how we clean our body. Very important. And it's going on all the time, all the time. It never stops. Except for maybe if we're deeply asleep, the lymph slows way down because we're not moving very much. So, so again, it requires that movement. And that's, why, that's another reason why exercise is so important <laughs> to our health. The flow of lymph is anywhere from about four ounces to 60 ounces per hour. So when we're, when we're, if a person is out for a run, then they're gonna be moving a lot more lymph. And so going back, so we've talked about lymph fluid. It's all that fluid that's out of the bloodstream. And we've talked a little bit about the, the lymph vessels that form and pump. And so going back to lymph nodes. So lymph nodes are kind of, they tend to be, there tend to be more lymph nodes in places where there's more stuff coming in from outside. Like for instance, around the neck, there's a lot of exchange with the air, and so we have lymph nodes to, to clean the lymph vessels. That's what they are, they're, fi they're little filters that are sitting along the vessel and they capture things that need to be cleaned out. And um, we also have lots of lymph nodes in the armpit and the groin, but the main concentration of lymph nodes is around the large intestine. Large intestine starts on this right side, goes up, across and down and then to the back. And so, and what, what is the main population of the large intestine? Bacteria, there's trillions and trillions of bacteria. That's kind of the gar that's kind of their home, home base is the large intestine. They're kind of all around, in and around us too. But, and so we wanna, so we wanna have a way to protect the bloodstream from those uh, bacteria, so there's lots of lymph nodes around the, the large intestine to catch anything that's not supposed to come through. And by the way, if you're if you're watching this as a video, now might be a good time to, to stretch a little bit or kind of kind of do a little bicycle <laughs> or move or you know move your legs or stand up and walk around while you're watching. That's actually a really good thing. Or maybe you have a, a stationary bicycle or something. That's a good time to watch things like this when you're moving. All right, very good. <laughs> so, going back to those lymph vessels, they have little one-way valves. So there's so there's these there's these little tiny cellular structures of the vessels, and they have little one-way valves that only allow the lymph to go one direction. And um, you probably noticed that I mentioned that the main lymph, all the collection of the lymph vessels goes up under the collarbone. Well, that's a long way from the floor, especially in my case. <laughs> and so the lymph is working against gravity. So it's a good thing that the vessels have those little one-way valves so it only allows the lymph to go one way. But gosh, you know, and so there's a lot of things we can do to enhance that lymph flow. Let me just make sure I've got, make sure I've covered everything here. Let's look at some things that can inhibit the, lymph, the lymph flow. And um, so, and it, I just mentioned being sedentary is probably one of the hardest things for the lymph system. And gosh, haven't we become a little more sedentary in the last couple of years? I know I have. So just kind of keep in the back of your mind that when you're sitting with your eyes glued to something, 
that that it's good to just move just move a little bit to stretch stretching is really good kind of a good um, way to move the muscles without putting a lot of strain on them some other things that are hard on the lymphatic system eating sugar which we'll come back to that in a minute drinking coffee kind of whips the whips the lymphatic system smoking pretty much anything is hard on on the lymph system alcohol sugar and alcohol in the same camp processed foods fast foods because it it loads the system so it makes the lymph have to lymph system have to work harder food that's been irradiated tap water because of the chlorine and fluorine in some places um, certain drugs like birth control pills steroid drugs steroid is an interesting word because it comes from cholesterol we make steroid hormones and um, there are drugs that mimic those like cortisone is a synthetic version of cortisol which we make and so steroid means it's like it comes from cholesterol um, antibiotic medications are hard on the lymphatic system having doing anything that affects our hormones especially like surgery on a gland or um, taking any kind of synthetic hormone would be hard on the lymph system having an x-ray so it's good to drink lots of water if you have an x-ray. We'll come back to that. Um, things like electric blankets, sleeping under an electric blanket. It creates this low level magnetic, electromagnetic frequency that can be disturbing to the body in a lot of ways. So it's, you know, heat your bed up at night, jump in, and then rely on your body to stay warm under that down blanket. Um, there's plenty of other environmental toxins that were around and they're all congesting and affect and they affect the immune system as a result and another big big way that big thing that's hard on the, uh, the lymphatic system is stress in general so that's why it's good to do things like meditate and and have a strategy for dealing with stress my teacher used to say Stress is to the lymphatic system as frying is to bacon. It kind of causes it to, it causes that lymphatic system to wither a little bit, to atrophy. So you really need to have a, a, some strategies for handling stress, and that's a whole other subject. <laughs> so way, ways that we would know that our lymphatic system is kind of congested is, is a sore throat, um, having too much mucus, having the sinus be plugged up, um, problems with the digestion, like the stools being irregular, constipation and diarrhea and so forth. Allergies in general, headaches are a sign of lymphatic congestion. Muscle pain and fatigue, even feeling depressed and kind of being apathetic, like, oh, just don't feel like doing anything. That's more the depression I'm talking about. Dark circles under the eyes. When the lymph nodes themselves are enlarged and tender, um, and also just, just being kind of tender all over. That's a sign of, of the lymphatic system being congested, especially, especially being tender kind of under the ribs and along the sides of the leg. And then also around here, the, the, what we call the breastbone or the sternum and then the collarbone. If those are areas that are tender a lot, that might be a time to put a little extra effort into moving the lymphatic system. And my favorite thing to talk about in general, it has to do with breathing. I mentioned a minute ago that there is a vessel that the, all the organs have a flow to the lymphatic system. And there's a vessel that goes right up in front of the, of the spine. So it's just on the other side of the spine. And there's kind of a little cistern there and, and then there's a lymph flow up in front of the spine. It's one of the only lymph vessels that you would actually see doing dissection. I did a whole year of dissection and you really don't see the lymph vessels. First of all, they're very tiny and they're just under the skin. But when, when we die, they kind of atrophy also. They sort of go back into the background. But that, that vessel that's in front of the spine, that is a visible lymph vessel. That vessel goes through the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is our breathing muscle. It's a dome-shaped muscle. It attaches all the way around here. And it has a reflex that says contract. 
and that's our inhale. So our inhale is when the diaphragm flattens out. And then it comes back up to the dome shape on the, on the exhale. So the, so the simple way to think about breathing, and there's a million different breathing exercises. I prefer to focus on breathing the way I breathe when I'm at rest. When I'm at rest, I'm breathing through the nose, in and out through the nose, into the belly. The, the inhale goes down into the belly, and the exhale is longer than the inhale. So a lot of times when I'll say, let's do a breathing exercise, you're able to go, you know, a big emphasize the inhale. We don't really need to emphasize the inhale. The inhale happens automatically. We just kind of allow that inhale to happen. But here's the key with the inhale. To make the inhale the most effective is to really relax the belly and let it pooch out. And, you know, especially as women, like, keep the belly in. <laughs> so it kind of goes against that. But and I even go a step further, and I, I like to relax the belly, and I see how far down, even to the pelvic, pelvic floor, I see how far down I can feel that expansion. And then a nice long exhale. So every time we do that, the diaphragm is kind of milking that vessel that has one-way valves. So every time we exhale, it's moving a little more lymph up that vessel. So the exhale is really the key the key to everything, but it's the key especially to lymph flow. And another thing I learned about that, I'll say as an aside, is um, nowadays we, in the psychology field, we talk a lot about the polyvagal theory, which is a big fancy word. And those of you who have studied that will know what I mean. And what I understand is that we think of the dorsal vagal as controlling the belly. The, and I think of it as the lower three chakras, the root, the sacrum, and the solar plexus. Well, when I'm relaxing that belly and allowing that inhale to go way down deep into the belly, I, I notice that it gives that belly a purpose. It gives it something to do, and it, it's very relaxing. And we think of the dorsal vagal as kind of where the freeze response comes from. So by breathing down into the belly and extending the exhale, that is the best way I know to calm that whole nerve system, to calm that whole stress response. So that's your best way to work on helping with stress. And if you want a little bit more focus on that, you can, you can think to yourself, on the inhale you can count to two, and on the exhale you can count to four. So it's one, two, three. So you see how long you can exhale for. Singers, you know, when we're singing, we're holding them down for a long time. And it's possible after saying, after singing a note and saying a lot of words, there's still air in there to exhale. So, so practice that exhale and see how long you can make it. Another key point for the lymphatic system is plenty of water. And a simple formula is take your body weight and divide that number by two. And that is the number of ounces to drink per day. And for most people, it's around a couple of quarts. And this glass is um, maybe half a quart or probably more than half a quart. And so it's really not that hard to get a couple quarts of water. In. So, and as soon as you get up in the morning, that's a good time to start really drinking the water because then you get a quart in by the time breakfast is finished, or the morning is finished, and, th and then you don't have to catch up at night when you might want to might want to sleep instead of getting up to go to the bathroom. Also, when when we see the skin being dry or when the eyes are dry, like if you if you kind of blink your eyes, if you can hear that noise, that means your eyes are dry, and that means you need to drink more water. And then, of course. What everyone talks about all the time is having, doing exercise, getting out and moving. So I encourage you to find something that you really love. Right here in this room, I come to African dance every Thursday night. That's what I love to do. And so I kind of stay in shape for that. And so some people love to hike. Some people like to go to the gym. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as it's moving and kind of gets your, gets your breath going. We're, we're lucky around here. We have lots of places to hike. So, some people like to ride their bike, you know, instead of taking your car to the bank, take your bike to the bank. 
things like that. That's all of that adds up and is really helpful. Another exercise that's really helpful is is a little mini tramp. They sell those at Big Five, and, and what that does is every it's basically using the muscles. So, but it's a way to kind of contract the muscles fairly quickly. That jumping up and down, and that gets the lymph flowing. It, it just moves the lymph right along. And this is another thing that I discovered recently. I'll come around here. Um, this is called a body blade, and um, there's a lot of information on it. It was developed by a physical therapist. And what we do is we kind of get it going like that. And what he found through his work is he was looking for an exercise that, work, that works all the muscles all the way into the spine, even the smallest muscles along the spine. So that's one exercise that we'll do. There's, there's one for the posture that you go overhead like this. And with the knees bent, and I can feel all the muscles in my whole body moving. And then um, what I, I kind of like to do, I do movements where I kind of get it going and, and rotate. And that, that works all the muscles too. And then here's one that really gets everything, gets every muscle, <laughs> you know, like that. So there's, there's YouTubes on it, and there's lots of stuff on the internet, but it's called a body blade. This is the regular one. There's one that's a little longer. But, and it's, so it's something that I can just have there, and, and I don't have to, you don't have to use it for a long time. You know, maybe in one position you might do for three minutes even, and then you can get a lot out of that. It kind of gets my heart rate going just doing that little bit. <laughs> so here's another thing you can do that's a little more sedentary. <laughs> But um, you can put your feet up. Um, just maybe get uh, some pillows or maybe a block of foam or a or cardboard box. Works really well. Put your feet up about 18 inches. And when, like before you go to sleep at night, to lie down and so that you're using gravity to bring that lift back. So if you're injured or something and it's hard to move, that's something anyone can do is put their feet up. It's actually very relaxing to the low back, too, to put the feet up. So, so the feet are here, the knees, and then the body comes down like that, and here's the head up here. So, um, and the, the knees, you can even lie with your back, and then your legs coming up at 90 degree angle. That's actually very helpful for the back as well. So if nothing else, you can put your feet up and use gravity to bring the lymph back up to the collarbone area. So I brought a couple of my favorite body brushes to this is this one is a little softer it's more it's a little softer and more gentle so it might be a good one to start with it's kind of like a cosmetic brush this one is a little stiffer but before before you go in the shower just just a quick brush up the arm maybe a couple strokes like that the in, both sides and then up the legs and you know up the torso so you're kind of encouraging those vessels that are just under the skin to pump a little bit and and it gets rid of some of the dead cells on the skin and so that's a really good way to um, move the lymph so some people uh, have a problem with posture and and like when we're sitting at the computer all day there's a tendency for this whole area to kind of cave in and the pectorals pectoral muscles that cover the whole chest here can become short and so we want so I brought my TheraBand and I, um, there's a couple of ways to do this. You don't really need a special tool. Like you can just use your, before, like again, when you get out of the shower, you can take your towel and just kind of go over the top of your head. But this TheraBand, when I tried it with the TheraBand, I really liked it because it's a little flexible. So what we're doing here is we're stretching this area out. And we want to keep the wrists nice and straight, and go over the top of the head, and go over the back and see how I can I can stretch it out a little bit as I go over and and it feels really good and it's a really good counter to all that computer work and sitting what that does is it stretches this whole area and opens it up and allows that lymph to flow into the subclavian vein another really key subject is lymphatic massage that's something I've been trained in I, I and what I learned is again those lymph vessels are just under the skin and it turn and so here's a key thing about the lymph flow it doesn't just flow like a river it has a it's more like an ocean it has a wave it's about three seconds of flow 
in three seconds of ebb, you could say. And also, since those vessels are just under the skin, if we just gently stretch the skin, it's a little, it's a little hard to see, but if we just gently stretch the skin without pressing on it, the, the cells that make up the lymph vessels are so tiny and so porous that as, as I stretch that vessel, it's gonna open up like that. And, it, and it's gonna invite the lymph fluid to come in. And then as I relax, it's gonna come back together and pump. And as I, op as I stretch the skin, it's gonna open the vessel up, space between the cells in the vessel. And there's a whole uh, sequence that we do, starting with the neck and to move the lymph on the whole body. I'll show you just one, the most basic move to help the lymph flow. So if you find your collarbone here, another key thing is we don't want to press into the skin. We're just barely touching. It's like if you were lifting a nickel. It's, it's, there's no pressure whatsoever. We're just, we're just touching the skin. And sometimes I'll turn my fingers over and kind of use my fingernails like I'm resting my fingertips on the collarbone right here. And so my fingernails are just touching the skin and then I'm going to, I'm going to move my hands towards the center very lightly, just taking the skin with me. I'm, I'm only pressing enough to bring the skin with me. You can use your fingertips too. So, so the, the kind of the rules are that the fingers are perpendicular to the direction that we're moving. So, so we don't tend to do this, we tend to have the fingers this way and we're moving this way. So, so I'm just taking the skin just above the collarbone and moving it towards the center and then coming back. And that's about a three seconds, three seconds of pull and three seconds of return. When I return, I have no pressure whatsoever. And if I were pressing any lighter, my fingers would just slide along the skin. But I'm just using enough pressure to take the skin with me and then coming back. And actually doing that move helps to encourage the lymph flow from the whole body. Because we're, we're, we're saying, hey, let's open this flow to the subclavian vein so the rest of the lymph gets the message and gets to flow, gets to pump a little bit more. Yeah, so three seconds of, of pull and three seconds of let up. You can even take your fingers off to make sure you're doing just fairly light flow. Three seconds in and three seconds out. And you do that maybe five or seven times. And then, and then when I'm working on a patient and doing a lymph, lymph uh, drainage sequence, I will you know, kind of go up the neck and, and um, work in, kind of in this area. We tend to do these things where there's lymph node chains, but, but right above the collarbone is a key spot to move that. So some other good things are um, just being out in the sun getting fresh air, of course, playing, being of service, being with your friends, um, following your spiritual path, and you know, facing our challenges. We all have plenty of challenges and, and really working towards resolving some of those things. Sometimes all it is is talking to someone and getting a different perspective and then you say, oh, that's the solution. And making sure we keep our self-esteem going um, whatever it is that helps you to remember that you're a very important person, very special person, and you deserve to be here. It's, it's very important. Let's look at some different foods and herbs that are good for the lymph system. The first thing I'll say is um, it's a kind of more of a supplement these days. And it's something I already mentioned that our liver makes. It's lecithin, L-E-C-I-T-H-I-N. And nowadays, it used to be soy was made, uh, lecithin was made from soy. And now soy is mostly GMO, so we kind of avoid soy as much as possible. And now we're making soy from, sun, I'm sorry, we're making lecithin from sunflower. And in fact, the whole sunflower family, which includes dandelions and Jerusalem artichokes and jicama and many other foods, um, are good sources of lecithin and and also inulin and things like that and in fact the dandelion flower is a good source of lecithin so put that in your salad 
and but you can you can get sunflower lecithin as a powder or as in a capsule. I put it in my smoothie every day because lecithin is an emulsifier. So say I had oil and vinegar dressing, and I, you know, when you take that and you shake it, after two seconds it separates in back to oil and vinegar. <laughs> Well, if I put a little bit of lecithin in there and shake it up, it breaks the fats down into tiny little particles so much that it just mixes it. And that's what emulsifying means. It, makes, it means to make it milky. And so the lecithin is really important to keep everything fluid. It helps the brain. It's food for the brain. And um, so that's a good one. So food is medicine. So the very first most important thing for the lymphatic system are all of our vegetables. Really half of our plate or more should be vegetables. And, and they're delicious, so that's a good thing. And they're usually the least expensive thing in the store too, so that's good. So all of your greens, things like spinach and all of your uh, cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, especially broccoli and asparagus are two key, key vegetables for us. The whole cabbage family that is. And beets, also excellent. So that's really our, the basis of our med medicine. And um, there are some herbs that I'll share with you. And again, I'll have this whole list with more particulars about what the herbs do at the end of the, the, t uh, the tape, end of the video. <laughs> um, so here's a list of some herbs that are fine to use fairly regularly because they are like foods. In fact, burdock root is is a food. You can buy it in the store as a, in the vegetable section. Burdock, it's, it has a giant root. And some, sometimes it's fairly dark. It, it's white inside, but it oxidizes, so it's dark on the outside. I'll just brush it off real well and either grate it into a salad or juice it sometimes, or anytime you make a soup, definitely put some burdock in there. Because burdock is a fantastic lymph cleanser. And uh, a few others are calendula, there's a sunflower for you, and dandelion, which I already mentioned, and echinacea, another, sun, another plant from the sunflower family. Those are all very good for the immune system, and, and echinacea can actually be used fairly regularly. We don't really you eat, we don't eat the same food every day, so we don't tend to use the same herbs all the time, you know, day after day. Um, it's good to take little breaks and have some variety, have some different herbs to change to. So, um, and a few more herbs that are good to use regularly, milk thistle. Milk thistle is wonderful. The, it helps the liver do all its work more, and so anything that helps the liver is going to help the lymphatic and the immune system. And violet as a tea, and yucca. I'm sure some of you use that regularly. And then these are, then this next list are herbs that we would use more by the season or kind of occasionally. Uh, cleavers, they come out in the spring, and they're really best when they're fresh. So when the cleavers are all covering everything in your garden, gather them up and you can juice them, and you can even freeze the juice, or um, you can add small amounts to other juices. Um, the whole barberry family, berberis family, Oregon grape, which grows around here in Barberry, has that brilliant yellow root, and that, that yellow root has something called berberine, which is getting a lot of press lately. It's really good for uh, the blood sugar and balancing a lot of things, and it moves the lymph. Red clover is another lymph mover, and um, it's also a blood thinner, so you have to be careful with that if you're on a blood thinner. And the herb, it's called red root. It's a ceanothus species. And that goes even deeper to help to heal things where, there's, where the lymph is kind of gathered and causing uh, problems like fibroids and things like that. And then sarsaparilla is another lymph mover. This is a tea that I discovered fairly recently. It's from the Ayurvedic tradition, this recipe. It's three herbs. They're seeds, cumin seed, coriander seed, and fennel seed. And we take about a half a teaspoon of each one of those, and we don't really want to boil them, but you can, you know, boil some water and then steep it in the boiling water, you know, after, after the heat is off. Or you can let it simmer just a little bit, being a seed, it, 
but it's mostly we steeping it. We don't really boil the seed. And it tastes great. As you can imagine, the fennel is delicious. And um, it, for instance, the cumin, cumin, which is a little warming, but the coriander and fennel kind of balance that out. But it, they relieve congestion. They help with elimination. Soothes the mucous membranes if they're inflamed. Help, it really helps with the digestion. So if there's any kind of indigestion going, this is a great formula. Um, help, you know, if a person's having gas, it's good for that. Um, even goes so far as to help with ir irritable bowel syndrome. And it's kind of muscle relaxing, so it just helps with helps the digestion in every way. And something else I learned is you can make this tea and you can dilute it with some water and then add some lime juice and a little bit of sea salt, not refined salt, but sea salt, and it makes a very good electrolyte replacement drink. So, you know, for those times in the summer when you're hot and meat and sweating a lot, it's good to good to use for an electrolyte replacement. So I'll finish up with this fun um, metaphor that I came up with for the immune system. A lot of times when we when people talk about the immune system, they'll they'll talk about a war or fighting, you know, fighting the illness. And so I came up with another way to think of it. And I like to think of it as a party going on in the, in the body. And it's kind of a cleanup party. And it's a game that's played by our system to keep the, in, the internal environment clean and keep it functioning and keep it in, in balance. For a party, you have to send out invitations. And so all those invitations and RSVPs and limousines for the affair travel through the lymph system. That's the, that's the channel, the, the mail system for the, for the immune system. And they send out millions of invitations because when, when something is going on in the body, there's millions of cells that they multiply and they come in to come to the party. What we think of as antigens, which could be a virus or bacteria or any kind of foreign substance, um, the antigens signal, let's have a party. So when an antigen comes in, it says, let's have a party. And um, the chef, I like to call her antibody, <laughs> and um, the, she prepares a meal for those hungry, all those hungry guests to come in and gobble up. And the guests with the invitations, which are the lymph cells, get really excited and they invite their pals to come. And those are, we think of the, as the free, the free lymph cells, the unattached lymph cells, to come to the dance. And those lymph cells, I think of them as the party animal because they clean up all the viruses and garbage. And so if you're having an infection, you can know that, that there's a real big luau going on inside there. <laughs> Now I hope that you have, have some more understanding of what's going on with the immune system, especially the lymph system. And um, I hope that helps you to recover and to keep yourself healthy, because that's the main thing. If we keep the lymph system going, we, we don't get sick. And um, I really appreciated this time being with you, and, and uh, feel free to contact me if you'd like more information. And thank you thank to you the, very much. Thank you to the Avenues to Wellness for the opportunity. <laughs>